Hello and welcome back to TYT's Earth Day special for 2020. Uh, I am very excited to talk for the first time to our next guest. Uh, one of the newest people to join on the TYT, our newest investigative reporter, Tiwa Cheng. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Happy to be here. Uh, very Happy glad to have you on. employed during this pandemic. <laughs> uh, you and me both, honestly. And, uh, you know, it's the support of our viewers that's allowing that. So thank you to everybody who's been so supportive of yes, us during thank this. Thank you during this lockdown. So um, this is the first time that we're talking. Uh, I was excited that when we brought on a new investigative reporter that it was going to be someone focused on climate. So um, I want to learn more about what you're planning to do, where you're coming from, basically uh, introduce you to the audience. Okay, well, I'm very proud to be doing this uh, because I think it's really a climate crisis. And I think uh, I told my teenage kids that, uh, you know, daddy's going to be doing something for your future. And then I feel that this is a, a crisis we have to address. And I actually am very honored to be able to deal with that. And I have to tell you, the more I read, the more I'm involved with the climate issues, the more I think it really is a, a crisis. It's something that must be addressed. Uh, we're just getting to the point where, you know, it's one earth. And I keep thinking about what happened in the Easter Islands uh, when an entire civilization, because they overfished and over uh, farm the land and, and knocked down the forest, they actually were wiped out as a civilization. Wow. So, and that's, you know, we've only got one earth. There's nowhere else we can go. You know, we don't have, we don't have warp speed yet. So <laughs> you have to deal with that. Yeah, I'm, I'm waiting patiently for that. Um, so I, I wanted to let people know that um, while, you know, you, you have a journalistic background, you also have a background in science as well, which I assume must have, you know, some impact on your coverage of uh, this sort of topic, right? Yes, well, it was a long time ago, but yeah, I, I got a biology degree from the University of Pennsylvania in population statistics of uh, genetics, population genetics. And uh, one of the things it did teach me was, number one, I'm not very good at research. I don't have the <laughs> patience for it. But number two, and this is probably more important, is that I it's really hard to get to the truth. In science, when you, you're trying to see something, it's true, and with experimentation and you know, and trials and other scientists checking your work and going back and forth. It really is a long and difficult process. And it taught me that to get to the truth is not easy. And it should be not should not be done lightly. You really have to work hard to get at the truth or as close to the truth as humanly possible. And, um, you know, one of the angles that you're going to be using to get to the truth when it comes to this climate uh, crisis is that you're going to be focusing on uh, money and how it intersects with the climate, the, you know, energy policy, all of that. So tell me a little bit about that as a strategy. Why should we be focusing on money when it comes to this problem? Well, when I, I asked somebody from uh, an environmental organization the other day, who's blocking us from doing the renewable energy right now? And he said, well, one of the main blockers are the oil industry because they've been getting profits from their their oil industry and, and from selling fossil fuel. And they want to maintain that because there's a whole sense in American business that you have your quarterly profit return. You have to come up with a profit every quarter. And so there's a sort of short-term return mentality and not a long-term approach. And so what happens is the, the money people are controlling things. And until we're able to see and convince the money people as well, because we are a predominantly capitalist society, we have to say to them, listen, you have to think long-term, not short-term. You have to think about it's your kids and grandkids that'll be on earth as well. And then in order to make the air clean and everything else and the, the water clean and not poison ourselves and have somewhere to be on Earth, uh, to have a home called Earth, you have to start thinking long term. The problem is the money people control so much. It it takes money to, to build solar farms and, and wind turbines and also geothermal. And we need that kind of investment, you know. So but we're starting to see that investment now because of the pandemic, two point two trillion dollars. You know, it would take a lot less than that two point two trillion to start turning much of this country to renewable energy, which, by the way, is free. Once you set up the infrastructure, there's no longer a charge for it, and it also gives us energy independence. So that's critically important. And involved with the money is the politics. You know, right now we have a president whom I believe is anti-science, anti-intellectual, totally pro-business, and very much focused on the short term and focused on himself, whatever it takes to win in his mind. But that winning for him is short term. You know, if he wins, the country and the world can lose. Pulling out of the Paris Agreement, not recognizing that, yes, in fact, 
you know, the, the CO2 level has to be reduced. And if you don't do that, we are going to have, you know, more storms. I covered Hurricane Sandy in New York. I saw the devastation. And you see that now. There, there's a belief that even the pandemics, because we are reducing the habitat for the wildlife, as we reduce that, the wildlife interacts more and more with different species. And as they do that, that means more of the diseases can be transmitted species to species and then ultimately go to people. And so there's a belief that you know, climate change is also affecting, uh, impacting the pandemics by creating more of them. Yeah, and um, some of the topics that you just mentioned actually uh, come up in some of the work that you've already done with TYT Investigates, including your most recent article, which had to do with um, the stimulus money effectively. And so um, we hypothetically could have had a great deal of money go towards revamping uh, the way that energy is produced, distributed and consumed in America. Um, how would you rate overall the share of the money that's been divvied up as a response to coronavirus going to green sources? And, and how are the fossil fuel industries doing under uh, the current distribution of funds? Okay, well, certainly in terms of renewables, we're not getting it. I mean, they, there's no no money. And uh, Nancy Pelosi said, admitted that and said the next stimulus package would include that. That's what she said at this point. On the other hand, the fossil fuel industry, the oil industry wanted a bailout of $3 billion and Democrats, certain Democrats, progressive Democrats and environmentalists were able to stop that. So in that sense, that was good. But what the Trump administration has done, and I'll be talking about this in my next article, which will be coming on this week, Trump administration, the Department of Interior, well, one thing they said to the oil companies, you can now store your oil because there's so much, because there's an oversupply now and under demand because of the, the pandemic, there's so much oil out there, they have nowhere to put it. So they're going to put it in the strategic petroleum reserves. These are huge tanks that store uh, all the uh, basically reserve petroleum the country keeps in case of emergencies. And they're going to put it in there for free. And the Department of Interior has said that uh, the oil and gas companies do not have to pay royalties now for the use of federal lands and waters. You know, when they have their oil rigs and different gas rigs set up on uh, both land and water, uh, there were royalties. And a number of Democrats wrote a letter to the Secretary of Interior, uh, Bernhard, and said, you know, in the, since 1995, since you relaxed these royalties, uh, taxpayers have lost $18 billion dollars. Now, if you completely stop them, we're going to lose even more. And we need that money to deal with the pandemic. So this is a combination of both, you know, money and politics. And that's uh, that's what we're trying to focus on, money and politics. And and my marching orders also include getting stories that nobody else has. <laughs> and, and we're going to try and do that. <laughs> I, I certainly hope so. Um, and so uh, sort of stepping back, I, I guess my last question, I mean, it, it's it's Earth Day. Every Earth Day, I think about how far we've come in whichever direction since the last one. I'm curious, as a person who takes this crisis very seriously, your work is going to be centered around it. You know, since the last year, obviously, we've, we've had a lot of conversation about the Green New Deal, many candidates signing on to some formulation of it. You know, between last Earth Day and this Earth Day, um, do you feel that we've moved in a positive direction? Do you feel like... Uh, industry has been able to hold off the sorts of reforms that are necessary. How, how much progress, if any, do you feel like we've made in the past year? Well, up to the pandemic, I'd have to say that uh, the Earth Day organizers have indicated that actually the Earth Day number of people attending Earth Day has dropped. Uh, it, it, that's what was on their website. But since the pandemic, and the realization by people, I think, that the pandemic may, in fact, be a result of climate change or climate change certainly has an impact on it. I think we'll see a lot more involvement, but the involvement is not going to be in a big march. Obviously, you can't do that with the coronavirus out there because the social distance is just, you know, we're going to spread the virus if that happens. So this will have to be basically an Internet march and an involvement in that way. But there's a lot of ways that people can be involved and that are brought up by the Earth Day organizers. Uh, Oh, for me, personally, if there's one thing that people have to make sure they do if you want to save the earth is to get rid of Donald Trump. I mean, he clearly <laughs> has no interest. I mean, if you look at his policies, I wrote this in the last article, it's like during the pandemic, they've continued their, they're very consistent, very pro-business, anti-environment. They're just one thing after another. For example, the, uh, they just, the EPA relaxed 
uh, during the Obama year, they relaxed the re- the percentage of reduction uh, of the auto emissions. It was set by during the Obama administration to be set at five percent reduction, and then Trump just his EPA just reduced it to one point five. Now that's that's got an impact on real lives because they're finding out that even a small part of pollution can make somebody's uh, reaction to an infection by the coronavirus much, much worse. And we're seeing that particularly in communities of color where the pollution is greater and they're having a much higher incidence of deaths because of the coronavirus. So this is really having real impact on people's lives, killing people. And so unless you have an administration that acknowledges that yes, there is a climate crisis and we have to deal with it. If you don't have that, and they're going in the opposite direction, doing everything pro-business, regardless of what that does for the environment, then that's the big problem. The other things too, is you can certainly support organizations that are fighting for climate change. There are many of them out there. And on a personal level, uh, I, I hope I pronounced her name correctly. There's an environmentalist in Canada named Dr. Hayhoe who said, the number one thing you can do personally is talk to your family and friends, immediate family and friends, on what to do. For example, with, with my family, one of the things we talked about was making sure that we transition all of our electricity to renewable sources. We already transitioned our home account to only solar and wind power in New York State. And we could do more, you know, try to do that, get more of our friends and family to do the same thing. I also had it done for my mother. My niece had it done for my mother. And then I talked to my family about, well, let's not let's stop drinking all this bottled water, this the plastic, those that huge island of plastic, the size of Texas and the Pacific Ocean, ought to convince everybody to stop using, you know, drinking from plastic bottles as much as they can and stop using it. And in fact, the other day I saw a video of a a uh, a large a sea lion in, uh, I, I think it was in Australia, that had a piece of white plastic wrapped around its neck and it couldn't get it off. And and what had happened is actually an enclosed circular, just a thin strip. But they said eventually it would wear out and tear into this, this animal's neck. And so what they did is they captured it and they cut it. And when I looked at that strip on the video, it was exactly the same strip that had just wrapped one of my Amazon packages. In fact, the trampoline that my kids got. Oh wow! So, and I hope, and I recycled it. But you know, right now we don't know where that recycling is going anymore. For a while, the recycling from the U.S. was going to China, but China said, "Okay, we've had enough of your recycling. We don't need it anymore. Don't send yeah. it anymore. We have nowhere to put it." And so now, <clears throat> when I talk to people here about recycling, it turns out. Uh, What's happening is most of the recycling now is actually just being stored. We don't have a, enough capacity to transform all those plastic bottles. And the interesting thing behind this is where money and politics comes involved into it. A lot of the plastics industry was pushing for recycling so that people would think that, oh, I can, I can drink from a plastic bottle because it'll get recycled into a jacket. Reality is that's not happening. Reality is those plastic bottles are now going to landfill. They crush them. And they have nowhere to recycle because there's too many. Wow. That's, you know, that's where the money comes in because, you know, that's the, the plastic companies. In fact, in Oklahoma, the, uh, the education departments in Oklahoma don't have enough money. The teachers don't have enough money to give materials to their kids. So the oil industry came up with something called peat, pistol peat. I think, yeah, pistol peat. And, or peat, no, I'm sorry, it's Pete Petro, Pistol Pete is some cartoon. Sorry, <laughs> it's Pete Petro, and it's a cartoon character. He's a cartoon character that tells you how wonderful petroleum products are. Oh, but the teachers, because they have no other sources, are using Petro Pete to teach their kids, just because they're not giving enough money into the school system. And this again, this is where politics and money uh, cross to each other, because you know, because the the uh, the oil company executives are able to get more money for their companies and not put more money into taxation, the schools don't have enough money, and then they end up giving them petrol peak. So. Yeah, and God knows what those kids will end up thinking about some of these things when they get older. Hopefully this won't be the only place they get their information from. Um, right. And uh, one place I hope that they do is your future writing. It's why I'm so excited uh, that you've joined us at TYT, and I'm looking forward to uh, all the awesome work that you're gonna do. And um, thank you thank so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. It, it was great getting a chance to, to finally talk with you. I really do appreciate it. Good to talk to you. Happy Earth Day. You too.